Guns, you know those little things that go pew pew? Well, guns have had a massive impact on many things in our history and society. From video games, hunting, American education, and of course, modern warfare. You name it, everybody knows what they are and how impactful they can truly be. The distribution of firearms across the world is at an all-time high, be that legally or illegally, which is no surprise. And of course, I can't account for why there are firearms in literally every area all over the world since there are a variety of reasons why that is. But of course, there were a few big players out there who would contribute massively to the increase in distribution of firearms all over the world. Sure, there are the small-scale scenarios of straw purchases, theft and illegal imports, but I'm talking larger scale than that. I'm talking about supplying enough firearms to arm, well, an army. Well, the man that we're going to be covering today is well known for his profession of trading weapons all across the world. Because there are over 550 million firearms in worldwide circulation. That's one firearm for every 12 people on the planet. The only question is, how do we arm the other 11. Victor Boot, also known as the Merchant of Death. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, this video is brought to you by Fume. Fume is an award-winning device that is all about helping you break your bad habits in an innovative way. But breaking a bad habit doesn't have to be an uncomfortable or drastic change, so Fume is here to remove the bad from the habit. Instead of using electronics and annoying people with giant flavoured clouds, Fume is completely natural and instead uses flavoured air. Not only is the air flavoured, it's made using all natural delicious flavours that contain no harmful chemicals. So Fume really is all good with none of the bad. You can simply enjoy your habit guilt free and replace your old bad habits easily. Your fume will come with an adjustable airflow dial that is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers something to do which is helpful for de-stressing and easing anxiety while breaking your habit. After trying the new fume flavours myself, I was honestly very surprised at how flavourful it is. It feels very fresh and the moving parts are great for helping to fight stress. I've been feeling great since using it. Stopping is something that we all put off because it's very, very hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. So join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com slash dankula or scan the QR code on the screen and get an amazing 10% off site wide. That's tryfumefum.com and use code dankula to save an additional 10% off on your order today. Click the link, show them some love. Let's start with a look at Boots' early life to get a good background on how this one guy became so infamous with governments all over the world. Now, I will preface this video with a little disclaimer. Due to the nature of Boots' work and his background of living in the Soviet Union, there might be some things that we aren't 100% sure about. But, of course, I'll highlight this when it's relevant. Because someone like Victor Boot isn't exactly going to be very forthcoming with information about his illegal activities. Disclaimer over, so being involved in any trade of firearms comes with a crazy amount of secrecy, and of course, undercover operations. Because when you are an international under-the-table arms dealer, you kind of don't want anyone knowing who you are. Especially any governments. Unless, of course, it's one of the governments that you're selling to. As with most high-profile individuals from the Soviet Union, they are very often shrouded in mystery. Well, 
for the most part. Boot had a pretty standard early life, or as standard as it can be for a Soviet citizen. Some of the more obvious and easier facts of other mad lads, such as their early life, their birthplace, their parents, can all easily be found on the internet. But this is a very different case for Victor Boot, who seems to have taken measures to hide all of that information, because of course, he didn't want people knowing too much about his past. Which is understandable considering his line of work. What was found about his personal life was stringently tracked by intelligence agencies in the Anglosphere, either from previous documentation from his education and military training, or by in-person accounts from colleagues of his who were willing to talk, who were few and far between. So, according to Western Intelligence, Viktor Anatolievich Boot was born on the 13th of January 1967 in the ex-Soviet state of Dushanbe, Tajikistan. Boot has previously mentioned that he was in fact born in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan, but again, we have to take everything with a pinch of salt. Either way, we're pretty sure that he was born in some ex-state of the USSR. As with a lot of citizens of the USSR, many ethnicities and nationalities were far spread throughout the conglomerate, with different ethnic groups settling in various states. This was no different for Victor Boot, with his background apparently being a mix of Ukrainian and German, but again, we aren't even 100% sure of that because even the top spy agencies found it very difficult to figure that information out. Boot has claimed that his father was a car mechanic while his mother was an accountant, so presumably he may have had a pretty humble life while he was growing up. But all of this could just be a cover story because there were speculations that Boot had a background in the KGB, with one or both of his parents allegedly being high-ranking Soviet intelligence agents. But we couldn't confirm that. As for Boot, the KGB allegations wouldn't stop there, and for obvious reasons. Now, according to more information gathered on Victor Boot, he attended school in Dushanbe, becoming an avid linguist, learning both Persian and Esperanto at just the age of 12, even being a regular of the Dushanbe Esperanto Club. This love of languages would continue throughout his later years and would become very, very useful in his future international career. Now, we aren't sure of Victor Boot's specific academic career, but apparently before moving out of Dushanbe, he obtained a sociology degree in intercultural communications, which again, sounds like it would be pretty useful for any international business. This part of the video has actually been very, very frustrating because a lot of this information that I'm giving you is just we think. Because it has been so difficult to actually figure out the facts around Victor Boot. So, I'm very, very sorry, but this is the best we can do. Sadly for Boot, his life in Dushanbe was coming to an end as, along with his parents, he would move to Moscow. Now, it's not clear if he volunteered or was conscripted, but either way, Mr. Boot was about to join the Soviet military at the age of 18. He would be placed into Moscow's Military Institute of Foreign Languages, where again his love of languages would flourish, allegedly becoming fluent in English, Portuguese, French, Arabic, and Farsi, along with his previously learnt languages. So yeah, the man was a full-on polyglot with a degree in intercultural communications. Again, according to Western Intelligence at the time, Moscow's Military Institute of Foreign Languages was considered highly linked to the Soviet espionage services by training spies in languages and culture so that they could blend in to whatever country they were deployed to. So yeah, remember when I said that Boot wouldn't be beating those KGB allegations? Well, it really didn't help that Boot was also an alleged prize student within the Institute. But it wasn't just all theory and academics for Boot, because of course in the military you eventually have to do your time. This is when Boot's adventure would really begin, and he would start off as a translator for the Soviet military, sent off to Africa at just the age of 20, heading to Mozambique. 
Eventually, he would be stationed in Angola alongside Russian peacekeepers during the Angolan Civil War in the late 80s. Whilst in Angola, the Soviets were responsible for assisting the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, the MPLA. And yeah, this was just another of one of the very many times that the Soviet Union and the United States would pick sides in a skirmishing nation attempting to influence their political sphere towards either a democratic capitalist nation or a communist nation. Basically, just another standard US versus Russia proxy war. Kinda like the one that's happening right now. Although Boot wasn't in Africa for very long, he claimed to have learned even more languages such as Zosa and Zulu. Bro was just straight up putting all of his skill points into speech. I mean, there are even more accounts that he was also familiar with German, Urdu and even Spanish. I can't tell if this guy's just a master shit poster taking advantage of his mysterious background, claiming to know all of these languages when he doesn't really, or if he is just straight up autistic and fucking loves languages. But his military career wouldn't last for very long because, as I'm sure we're all aware, the Soviet Union would soon collapse and the Iron Curtain would fall in late 1991. But thankfully for Boot, he wouldn't walk out of this shit show empty handed, leaving the military with a disputed rank of either a lieutenant or potentially as a major. All we do know is that he was most likely an officer in the Air Force. Maybe, again, we, we have absolutely no idea. All of this has been really difficult to confirm. But, along with his previous rank, the plethora of learned languages and experience as a flight navigator, he also earned a degree in economics from the military. So, we are dealing with a military trained individual with a high amount of education in languages, intercultural communications and flight navigation along with an economics degree. This would be the perfect foundation for Boot's next adventure across the world. The cherry on top would be the collapse of the USSR, a massive military powerhouse with shit tons of leftover weapons, alongside plenty of individuals who were put out of work due to the economic situation. This meant that a lot of military personnel's paychecks just stopped coming in, because the government was in utter shambles. So, what were these guys going to do for money now? Well, being military personnel, they had access to a lot of weapons. Warehouses just absolutely packed with all kinds of armaments just sitting there not doing anything. And all the guys whose job it was to catalogue and count these armaments had all quit because their paychecks stopped. So, no one would really notice if 1 or 2 or 12 or 3,000 AK-47s just so happened to go missing because they were sold to some mysterious benefactor while they pocketed the money. Did you ever wonder why the AK-47 is the weapon of choice for rebels and terrorists all over the world? That's why. Despite this being a very tough time for people in Russia, it wasn't all doom and gloom for Victor Boot, even if his countrymen were in disarray, because he would eventually marry the love of his life, Ala Vladimirovna Boot, who he first met in Mozambique during his translator work for the military, marrying her a few years later in 1992. They would have a very happy marriage, moving into a one-bedroom apartment, often going on road trips and enjoying their new marriage amongst the chaos of a post-communist Russia. But with the fall of communism came the rise of capitalism within Russia, creating a new opportunity for Victor Boot. With his previous knowledge in aircraft navigation alongside his knowledge of economics, he thought of the idea of starting an import company. A lot of highly sought after foreign goods were actually banned in communist Russia, but now that the Iron Curtain had fallen, these goods could now be imported. But saw a market opportunity and decided to go for it. 
Now, there are a few variations to this story, which again is hard to verify, but Boots' side of the story goes something like this. With these new business ventures in mind, along with the help of his family and ties to the military, Victor Boot managed to purchase three Antonov cargo planes after the dissolution of the USSR at a price of roughly $120,000. The reason he was able to just buy three cargo planes for so cheap is for the same reason we discussed earlier. The paychecks stopped coming in for the guys who were in charge of the planes. So, they just sold them. This would be perfect for his plans of international imports. Although the other side of the story is that Victor Boot allegedly had ties within the GRU who are also known as the main directorate of the general staff of the armed forces of the Russian Federation. Basically, another one of Russia's intelligence agencies. Apparently, the GRU had supplied Boot with the aircraft because they were just sitting in a hangar anyway, so they might as well give them to someone who will actually use them. And the GRU would then receive a cut from the money that Boot would make from his new business. Whether this is true or not, we don't actually know, but Boot has insisted that he managed to collect the money himself and invest it in the surplus aircraft. Who knows? Well, someone in Moscow knows, but that's besides the point. After his initial plans to work in the import trade, Boot moved on to leasing the cargo planes to other clients. His plan was pretty simple, lease the cargo planes to himself and then sublease them for three times that amount. Or at least that's what one source claims. Some of his biggest customers included the country of Angola, who Boot was already used to working with during his previous military work there. It was one of the few countries that also allowed for civilian operations for the Antonov 8, which in many countries was classified as a military freighter, so it wasn't allowed in their airspace. During these early cargo shipments, most of it was harmless and legal cargo. Anything from gladiolus flowers, frozen chickens, and apparently even diamonds. But these trades were not going unnoticed even if they were legal, because apparently MI6 and the CIA were keeping an eye on Victor Boot's continental adventures, after his planes literally and figuratively came up on their radar. However, after some business failings due to apparent inner conflicts within his company, Boot needed a new office outside of Europe. So, around 1993, he headed towards the UAE to look for new business opportunities, especially since it was considered a free trade zone. There, he would again ship out more consumer goods to ex-Soviet nations. Business was booming, and it was non-stop work for Boots Company. People were in and out, planes were taking off and landing, and of course, the cash was flowing in. But money wasn't the only thing coming into Mr. Boots' life. In 1994, whilst in the UAE, Allah, his wife, gave birth to their first daughter, Elisaveta. But sadly, Victor had missed the birth due to him being elsewhere at the time, but he managed to fly out to see them the very next day. By then, Boot was making a serious amount of money. He even bought his family a small apartment in the UAE so that he could be closer to them. But then things took a turn, and it would all kick off where Victor Boot first had his adventures. Angola. In the mid-90s, Angola started a little bit of a boogaloo, and a full-on civil war was imminent. Tragic news, but this was the perfect opportunity for Victor Boot to make some money. Boot sent a team of his ex-military confidants to help support Jonas Savimbi, the rebel leader of UNITA, or the National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, who were fighting against the communist MPLA. The team claims that they were not to provide any new arms, but just to assist with the maintenance, upkeep and training with the old Soviet arms that the Angolans already had left over from the previous conflict which they weren't too skilled in using or maintaining. But thankfully for Victor, he had the perfect cover-up whilst operating in Angola. There were plenty of good reasons for him to be there. 
The main reason being the shipment of legal goods. However, the Angolans were not looking for legal goods. They were looking for guns. And if there is demand for something, the market will step up and create supply. But to deal in arms, you first need a supply of arms. And where else would you go other than a post-Soviet state like Bulgaria? Filled to the brim with weapons factories, all sitting there, just doing nothing. This is when Boot first came into contact with a Bulgarian arms broker by the name of Peter Murchev, who ran a company called KAS Engineering. This would be Boots' man for a supply of arms and munitions to then sell on to third world nations' governments or the rebel groups trying to topple those governments. These first few sales generated way, way more income than Boot was making from selling legal goods. So he decided to take the business down this direction. But it wasn't always fair game when dealing with rebel groups or militias. This was clear when Boot ran into conflict against the Taliban in the summer of 1995. Afghanistan was at war and the government was desperately in need of arms to fight against the rebelling Taliban. So, who do you think showed up to the scene? Mr. Sanction Buster himself, Victor Boot. The Pakistani-backed Taliban were trampling the government troops, so it was clear that they needed new arms and they needed them ASAP. After a quick stop in Tirana, Albania, Boots men, with the help of some Albanian soldiers, allegedly loaded his cargo planes with over 3 million 762 rounds, which were headed for Kabul. They had managed to make several trips to drop off the cargo before they were intercepted by Taliban air forces consisting of, ironically, an outdated MiG-21, designed and produced by the Soviet Union. That's just how it was after the Iron Curtain fell and spurned Soviet soldiers started selling off Russian armaments. Third world governments and rebel groups all over the world were all fighting each other with Russian weapons. So the cargo plane was forced to land in the hands of the Taliban, who of course weren't much of a fan of Boot who was actively supplying their enemies. Boot eventually met with the Taliban leader Mullah Omar to negotiate the release of his crew. Sadly, they weren't leaving any time soon and they were kept in Taliban captivity. But Boot wasn't just going to let his men rot in a Taliban prison. The pilots managed to come up with a plan. They knew that the Taliban planned to either keep or sell the plane, so the pilots and the crew told the Taliban that if the plane was to remain operational, it would require regular engine tests. And the only people who had the skills or the knowledge to carry out these tests were the pilots and the crew. So, the seed was planted and worrying about the plane being rendered useless, the Taliban allowed the pilots and the crew to go onto the plane to carry out these tests. The crew waited until Friday prayers, where they knew that most of the guards would be out praying, and they would only be guarded by a skeleton crew of guards. The captives then overpowered the leftover guards before taking off in the plane. The Taliban did attempt to prevent the plane from leaving by apparently attempting to block the runway with a fire truck. But that plan failed. Soon, the crew were back on their way towards Moscow, and they were even met with a hero's welcome from everyone around them, and allegedly even received medals from the president at the time, Boris Yeltsin. But that story might not actually be true since there are plenty of speculations from Western intelligence officials regarding the legitimacy of how things actually played out. Some speculated that instead, an arms deal was arranged with the Taliban in exchange for the release of the prisoners. There was also hints that Boot gave himself in future interviews that the story was actually a massive cover-up because there were other governments involved who he couldn't disclose. But hey-ho, who knows? Well, someone knows, but they're not talking. Once again, Boot and his ex-army comrades were reunited, ready to set off on new adventures. 
but his endeavours were not going unnoticed, and many three-letter agencies were now on his tail, keeping an eye on his exploits. You see, it was very, very difficult to actually track Victor Boot, even when he had his finger in so many pies all over the world. He had several companies in several countries, from the UAE, South Africa, to Rwanda. He had several passports and good connections, especially in Russia. So, even after the fact, it's very hard for us to track all of the places that he operated in and out of. And this is just all the stuff we know about, which I think is just the tip of the iceberg of his black market operations. Boot had connections all across Africa as well. There were plenty of nations that sprung up out of the decolonisation of Africa in the mid-1900s that were all completely unstable, with leaders all across the continent fighting for power. This was perfect for not only arms trafficking, but also earning some extra cash by using your ex-military employees to train up whoever wanted their soldiers trained. So you've got all of these unstable African governments all armed to the teeth with Soviet weapons. And Boot, with his small army of ex-Soviet soldiers who were well trained enough to educate these militias on how to operate such equipment and much more. Remember fellas, on the top of the AK is the power slide. The higher the number, the harder it shoots. Boot was now starting to make a name for himself, from the UN to even British Parliament. Victor Boot, the Merchant of Death, Victor Boot, the Sanctions Buster, and even the alternative name of Boris. I have no idea why that one was picked or what it's even supposed to mean. He went by very many names, but the Merchant of Death was the one that stuck throughout his career. Things were changing very quickly for the newly titled Merchant of Death, and the next big impact on his business would happen miles away from his area of operation. New York City. The straw that broke the merchant's back wasn't another conflict in Africa or the Middle East, but rather 9-11. The 9-11 attacks made the entire world learn who the Taliban are. This caused a lot of government agencies to look into who was supplying the weapons to such groups. And one name kept coming up. Victor Boot. But not just him, they were also looking into other individuals involved in the same industry. And the US and other Western nations vowed to crack down on international gun merchants fueling such attacks. So, this gave the United States the perfect reason to start hunting for Mr. Boot. But not only that, they wanted to get him behind bars in a US federal prison. So, the hunt began. Slowly but surely, more and more of the previous clients that built up Boot's empire all across Africa were now turning their heads from Boot, not wanting to draw attention to themselves by dealing with his arms business. This was during a time where having the USA breathing down your neck was very, very bad news if you were a developing country. Nowadays, eh, no one really cares. America is very, very quickly losing its hegemony and its status as the most powerful country in the world. Ironically, after the 9-11 attacks, Victor Boot was actually on the US most wanted list, right behind Osama bin Laden. Now, it's not clear at all that Victor Boot specifically supplied Al-Qaeda, who are a totally different group from the Taliban, with weapons or munitions. But because of his involvement in Afghanistan with the Taliban, it wasn't really hard for people to point the finger at Victor Boot and accuse him of working with them. Plus, obviously, any weapons at all being brought into the region could very easily fall into the hands of Al-Qaeda. Boot's counter-argument to all of the hot press at the time is that the Western intelligence agencies alongside the Western media wanted both a scapegoat for the war on terrorism alongside having old prejudices against the Russians due to the previous relations during Cold War I. I say Cold War I because we are currently in Cold War II. 
also boot supplied the enemies of groups that were being supplied by the CIA. And if there is one thing that the CIA hates, it's competition. Honestly, Boot was very open and didn't hide much from the media compared to what you think an international arms dealer would do in this situation. He openly went on radio talk shows to discuss the matter and maybe that was just a big brain way to use some sort of reverse psychology on the arguments from the Western media. Who knows, but either way, it didn't look like Victor Boot was actually running from the accusations. And it wasn't just the United States that was taking pot shots at Victor Boot. Back in Europe, out of all the nations, it was actually Belgium that started taking issue with Victor Boot. It's absolutely adorable that they still think they're a country. First to issuing an Interpol notice due to charges of money laundering Boot had allegedly committed, and in 2002 he was eventually on the Interpol Red Notice. For those who don't know, an Interpol Red Notice is when Interpol issues an arrest warrant for a person in every single country that is a member of Interpol. And since pretty much every single country is a member of Interpol, a Red Notice is essentially a global arrest warrant. So how was the United States going to get boot behind bars, especially while he was still in Russia? Well, they had to lure him out one way or another. And this time, it wasn't the CIA that would go after him, but it was in fact the DEA. Since they couldn't get to boot, they would try to get to one of his employees. And in an operation as large as Boots, there was plenty to choose from. And the Glowies just had to pick the right person, isolate them and get them to snitch and set Boot up by giving them a little push. But who? Well, there was one guy in their sights by the name of Andrew Somalian, a British-born South African who had been in the cargo business in South Africa for some time. Boot came across Andrew when he expanded into South Africa and recruited him into his large-scale operations. Sadly for Andrew, business hadn't gone so well in his end, and his operations weren't doing the best and it seemed he may possibly have resented Victor Boot for that. So, the DEA took advantage of this situation and set a plan in motion. Through Andrew, they planned a sting operation in Bangkok, Thailand, in which Boot was promised a deal with the supposed Colombian communist guerrilla group called FARC. FARC was obviously chosen to make Washington hate Boot even more by enticing him to go directly against American hegemony, since Washington was already providing weapons to FARC's enemies, the auto defences. But the representatives of FARC that Boot was about to meet with were actually undercover DEA agents waiting to lure Boot into a hypothetical arms deal. Boot, for some reason, was fine with leaving Russia, even though at the time this was a massive risk to him, due to all of the Western agencies dying to get their hands on him. Operation Relentless was in place and Boot fell for the trap, eventually leaving for Thailand in 2008. Upon going to Thailand, he went to the Silom Sofitel Hotel, where he entered a meeting room with the fake FARC members. They openly discussed what arms they would like provided and even underlined that they wanted to kill Americans, laying everything out in front of Boot so that when it went to court, everything would be pinned on him. And it would also show that he was only there to deal in arms with the intent of killing American citizens. And as you can imagine, just a few seconds later, the Royal Thai Police burst in and arrested both Victor Boot and Andrew Somalian. Apparently, when he was caught, Boot allegedly said, I guess the game is over. But it wasn't over for Boot just yet, and he was held in Thailand for quite some time. You might be wondering why that was. Well, why else other than international politics and petty bureaucracy? Because there were some disputes about the legitimacy of Boot being extradited to the United States. 
You see, everything was based on the premise of boot selling weapons to FARC, who were classed as a terrorist organisation by the United States and various other countries, although there were disputes about these classifications. Specifically, Russia wanted boot to be sent back home because Russia declared these actions were illegal. It would take a few years, but sadly for Victor Boot, he was eventually extradited to the United States, where he would be sentenced in 2012 to 25 years in federal prison. There were a lot of disputes around Boot's arrest, and people argued for both sides. But for Boot, he claimed that this was all just clear hypocrisy, because Boot was only doing what the US government does all the time. Now, most of the time with Mad Lads, the very, very heavy prison sentence is usually where the story ends. But not for Victor Boot. Victor Boot is still alive and still kicking, and this is where things get very interesting. Famously, Boot's wife Ala had said after her husband's conviction that he wouldn't see 20 years in prison. And she was right. Flash forward to 2022, and a women's basketball player from the United States would be playing for a Russian female basketball team by the name of UMMC Ekaterinburg. This basketball player, if you haven't heard of her already, not for her ability to shoot hoops, but instead for her ability to get arrested in one of the worst places a US citizen can be arrested, Brittany Griner. Now, she didn't really commit a crazy crime or anything too outrageous, but she was stopped at Sheremet Yevo International Airport after being found with hash oil cartridges. Shouldn't be a crime if you ask me. But even if this is a very small crime, carrying even the most tamest of drugs in the smallest amounts in a country that hates your country isn't a very good idea. So, just like all of those guys that try to smuggle weed into China, it doesn't end very well. So, she was promptly arrested, giving Russia the golden pawn that they needed to bend Uncle Sam's arm. Eventually, the United States and Russia came to the negotiating table, and Russia basically said, So, uh, what you got for me, big guy? And begrudgingly, the United States exchanged... Victor Boot. The United States traded Victor Boot, international arms dealer, the man literally called the Merchant of Death, and what they got in return was a female basketball player who hates America. Do you remember what I said earlier about America losing its hegemony? As for the media aftermath to this entire story, a movie was made loosely based on Victor Boot called Lord of War starring Nick Cage and I've obviously been referencing it throughout this video because it is my favourite Nick Cage movie. I'm not saying the others are bad, I'm just saying it's my favourite, right? I love it, it's such a good movie. Boot, however, didn't like the movie. <laughs> There was a Hollywood, Hollywood yeah, based uh, story. You know, I feel very sorry for Nicolas Cage who went to play this sort of love. It's very silly and I feel pity for... It's, it's bad mother. So Victor Boot essentially got off scot-free. I mean, not really scot-free, he did still have to spend about a decade behind bars in a federal prison, but he is now a free man in Russia, or as free as you can be in Russia. Boot has even joined the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia and might be running in the future. Hopefully not against Vladimir Putin because Putin's political opponents always seem to miraculously die in plane crashes or accidentally fall out of windows. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody says subscribe!